Hi everyone, I wanted to welcome you back to our Native Plants of the Great Basin Restoration Symposium. Um, we are going to start into part two of that right now. And so I'm going to pass it off to our first speaker, Allison. Hi everyone, thanks for joining. Um, and thank you, Sarah, for organizing this session. Um, my name is Allison Onure. And I am a PhD candidate um, at the University of Nevada in Reno. And I work with um, my two advisors, Beth Parchment or Beth Ledger and Tom Parchman. And I'm originally from Chicago, uh, but I fell in love with Nevada almost 10 years ago now and have since dedicated my life to restoring this landscape that I really adore. Um, and the title of my talk is Surviving in the Invaded Desert, which feels particularly appropriate for uh, 2020. Um, and I'll be presenting my dissertation work where we have been considering a new approach to high desert restoration, um, considering traits in seven different species. So hopefully you're seeing my screen, um, but as we've been hearing all day, there's a lot of variation between um, populations of the same species. Uh, plants in particular are famous for their intraspecific variation, uh, like Poa secunda and its many varieties here in the Great Basin. And many of these trait differences have been directly linked to the plant survival and arise from local adaptation, um, which is really common in the Great Basin. And if you were here for Owen's first talk this morning, you've already seen the results of this recent article we put out finding um, how broadly common local adaptation is here. Um, and we found that in studies from the last 75 years, 95% showed trait variation across populations and 67% showed a local advantage over non-local plants. And most of this local adaptation work really focuses on the impacts of climate um, on plants, since we know that climate is tied to functional traits based on all this past work, but still we see significant differences in traits within plant populations coming from very similar environments and even the same seed zones. So climate doesn't really account for all of this trait variation. So we think there must be some other biotic factors that might be shaping these plants like disturbance history or gene flow. And in our study today, um, we measured the impacts that um, traits might have on survival in competitive disturbed environments specifically, and we considered these traits across populations of individual species. And I'll really dive into all of these questions as I go along and answer them. Um, so to address all these goals, we collected from across the Western Great Basin, um, where all seven of these um, plants were growing together in extremely similar climates. We only had two different seed zones across this whole area. And we used these seeds to establish three common gardens. And these garden sites would be considered a restoration nightmare. Um, they fell, again, into the same two seed zones as our collection sites, the sort of generalized seed zones. And all three had burned and were subsequently invaded by cheatgrass and then continuously grazed by deer and cattle. And we chose these environments for our gardens um, because we wanted to put our seeds through the gauntlet. If you could survive this type of landscape, then we think you'd be really relevant for other restoration projects in the region. So once we had our gardens picked out, collected all the seeds, we glued seeds individually to toothpicks and planted them to track their growth easily in this really um, sort of dense uh, field. Um, and then after planting, we monitored each seed for emergence and survival. And the results of this field test are my real primary indicator for um, a successful population. Um, unfortunately, shrubs and forb seeds didn't cooperate in the field, either due to dormancy or just not having enough replication. Um, so to overcome that lack of data, we also um, had an alternative indicator for a successful population using these competition experiments, um, where in the greenhouse we planted native plants alongside cheatgrass to be able to see what the impacts um, cheatgrass have on these plants. And it was really dramatic, as you see in these two photos. Um, while it's not the same as the field test, we can confidently say that these plants were really suffering um, with cheatgrass and two species were even reduced by over 80% when planted with cheatgrass. And that's only if they survived and a lot didn't. Um, so with that data collected, we answered our first question, um, looking at the differences in who survived um, based on where the seeds came from. And across the board here, just average rates of survival across all of the gardens that we had. 
Um, and I should note survival means you not only emerge from the ground, but then you also live to the end of the season. And there was a huge range in survival by species and the numbers in parentheses indicate the survival rates across gardens, which was also a pretty big range. Um, so first let's just clue in on Elemis at the California garden. So this graph has seed sources, so where they were collected from across the x-axis and then their um, survival at that garden on the y. And then that black line across the middle indicates sort of average um, survival. And you can see there were a lot of populations that were either above or below average. Um, and so the answer was to our question was yes, there is variation in survival. And I'm not going to show you every, results from every species, every garden, but they were replicated for all the shrubs and forbs and the stipa species in California. Now, one species, Poa secunda, was the only one that didn't show significant um, variation in survival uh, based on where the plants came from. Um, but a few seed sources did seem mostly above or below average. And the stipa also had the same null response at two gardens. Um, but all of this work led us to wonder for my next question, which was, could we identify um, any locations that were producing really successful seeds across all of the species? And that might point us to spots um, in the region where um, there are conditions ideal uh, for creating seeds that might do well establishing in an invaded system. And that's completely different than how we think about um, picking seeds for restoration now, where we use more of a mishmash of seeds pulled from multiple locations. And there really is growing evidence from more academic work and community ecology that show that plants sourced from the same locations and then transplanted together, um, they might benefit from some co-evolution and keeping them together in a restoration um, environment leads to more success in establishment. So asking this question was really tricky with our work since we had these multiple experiments and our species had those really um, different survival rates overall. So we decided to consider plants that underwent different methodologies separately um, and used relative survival instead of absolute survival to compare them. So first we'll look at the grasses in the field gardens. There was a significant garden by seed source interaction, meaning um, if you did really well in California, then you probably failed in Oregon or Nevada, which makes a lot of sense considering what we know about local adaptation. So I'll just be singling out results by garden location. And then similar to before, I'll have um, relative survival on the y-axis and where they came from on the x, but now species are going to be in these different colors. Um, so now we're just looking at results from California alone, and you can see, yes, totally some populations were across all three species of grasses were either above or below average. So that might indicate there's some evidence of shared history affecting their performance where these places like PL2, which is all the way on the right, are creating these winning, sort of winning seed sources, but places like AUSU are almost all below average. Um, and now let's look at results from the greenhouse with the shrubs and forbs. Um, again, there was variation, but we can see a few names that sound familiar, like PL2 is near the top in the top three, but then AUSU is down in the bottom in the bottom three. And, you know, these aren't um, in the same model because they had those wildly different methodologies, but it does seem like there is a biologically um, relevant pattern occurring here. So then using the same seeds that we collected for the first experiment, we then established a greenhouse common garden to extract seedling shoot and root traits for all species and populations. And our team harvested over 7,000 seedlings at very specific ages and scanned them to collect these fine scale data listed in the upper left figure. Um, and this is similar to Beth's talk earlier where she kind of reviewed these methods and we just put out a paper um, if you're interested in knowing how we do this. So I wanted to first determine um, if these traits were, these root, these like seedling traits were different um, across populations, across species. And there was only one exception across all of the species and traits. Um, but I can confidently say that seed source location, where they came from, predicted differences in every single trait, um, suggesting that there is a genetic basis uh, for these traits. And here's just an example with root mass ratio, um, where you can see 
the spread in how seedlings allocated their resources across species, but then also within species across populations. Um, and there were pretty wide ranges. So with all of this trait data collected, I asked my last question, which was, were these traits correlated with survival? Um, and I condensed all the trait and survival data and was able to plug them into these multiple regression models. So I'll show you um, the uh, results for the top three traits. So that top three traits were average diameter, days to emerge, and root mass ratio. Um, so I'll show you uh, the partial effects estimates on the um, y-axis. So you can see the impacts on survival for all these traits. So interestingly, the traits did not all follow the same patterns across all species. For instance, we can say generally larger diameter roots and less days to emerge were correlated with greater survival, but root mass ratio's impact on survival was split by species, where lower root mass ratio or less root mass compared to above ground growth, so they had a lot like bigger roots. That was really great for sagebrush, um, but higher root mass ratio um, what for rabbit brush in the Forbes was favored. And these results were really similar for grasses with only Poa secunda favoring the higher um, above ground growth. So I'll just quickly summarize. Um, despite being collected from very similar climates, our seed sources were different from each other, apart from Poa secunda in survival. Um, and then we found several locations with really high performing seeds. Um, across all of the species collected. So there, that might indicate some community level adaptation is occurring. Um, and then finally, there were a few traits that were generally predictive across all species of survival, like fast emergence and thick roots. Um, and as a quick final note, these findings are translating into action right now, where we made SOS collections of our top performing seeds and are now working to get them increased for use in future restoration projects. Um, we're also growing an F1 garden using all these same seeds to ask what the maternal effects are um, on these traits. And then finally, we created seed mixes using the top populations to understand whether all of this trait-based work might have impacts on um, a community when we plant them all together. So keep an eye out for our future work if that interests you. Um, and I was not able to do this work alone, and I want to thank all of these wonderful people who made it possible. And I also want to congratulate Fred Edwards on his new position and say that you will be really dearly missed. Nevada won't be the same without you. So thank you, Fred. Um, and I'd love to take questions if there is time.